Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining me for tonight's edition of Talk with Tasha. I'm Council Member Natasha Harper Madison, proud representative of Austin City Council District 1. From confronting racial injustice in Austin to dealing with a renewed spike in the COVID 19 pandemic, there is a lot to talk about right now. I want you to be a part of the discussion, so feel free to drop some thoughtful questions in the comments, and we'll do our best to answer them during the show. Before we bring out our first guest, I do want to take this opportunity, as always, to remind everyone about free, free, F-R-E-E, COVID-19 testing. This is hugely important right now, since the latest data shows that we saw our largest single-day spike in confirmed cases just yesterday. Two 120 new cases in one day is nearly 60 cases higher than our previous single day record, which just, which we just set last week. Right now, free testing is an option for everyone, even if you aren't feeling symptoms. All you have to do is go to www.austintexas.gov slash COVID-19. First, you register. Then you take an assessment. If you qualify, you can schedule your testing appointment. Once you're done, you will receive your test results right on your phone. It is so very important to note that any personal information collected during the process is for medical purposes only. No one will ask any questions about things like immigration status. Again, that website is www.austintexas.gov slash COVID-19. Well, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to tell y'all, it was another busy news day here in Austin. Uh, we started with a fresh report this morning from our Office of Police Oversight. The office took a look at police shootings in 2018 and determined that minorities made up the majority of people shot by officers that year. In the afternoon, we received a memo from our city manager, Spencer Cronk, that outlined his plans for reimagining public safety in Austin. That included the news that he is canceling the July cadet class. Finally, we also heard from Mayor Adler about a brand new COVID-related order. This is in response and to clarify um, an announcement made by Governor Abbott today that sites or that city, <clears throat> excuse me, cannot require individuals to wear masks, but they can, however, can require businesses to require their, their customers to wear them. And so to help me unpack it all, hey. <laughs> we got a special yeah, yeah. <laughs> to help me unpack it all for y'all. This is my colleague. Well, y'all know who it is, the, the man, the myth, the legend. It's uh, from District 4 in North Central Austin. You know him well. You love him. It's Greg Kassar. Hey, Greg, how's it going? It's going better now that I'm finally on talk with Tasha. I've been I've been jealous seeing everybody else getting on, and so I'm, I'm excited. Don't be jelly. Don't be jelly. Your it's turn was to admit being jealous <laughs> until I, you know, hold it inside for too long. Well, I'm glad you I'm glad you came on and I'm glad we get the opportunity, you know, like I said in my little opening piece about what a busy news day it's been. You know, I'm glad to be able to really just sort of talk through some of that with you and offer folks what they mostly want. You know, I, I you probably experience this too, but I find that more often than not, people just want clarity. Um, it's not even a matter of agreeing or disagreeing. They just want to know clearly what is happening. And so, uh, again, thank you for joining us. And I got a couple questions for you, but my hope is we can just kind of wrap and hang out a little bit. And then uh, throughout the course of the evening, we'll be bringing in some other guests. So I've been fielding this one a lot. Maybe you are too. Um, what do you tell people when they ask how they can help, how they can get involved? It's maybe my most frequently yeah. asked question. There are so many ways to get involved in, in city advocacy and city politics and what's happening in our city. Um, I was... Uh, in an advocacy group, doing community organizing before being on council. And so a really good way is to find a, a community organization that works on the things you care about, uh, because 
they really can watch city council agendas and let you know when the best time is to email in or to make a phone call. Uh, they, they a lot of times provide a lot of good information about what is what's happening at city hall. So that's a really good way to, to plug in. Another thing you can do is also just um, make your own voice heard your own way. You know, as you mentioned, uh, council member Harper Madison, the governor is now finally starting to allow cities to have mask rules. And he wasn't in that place just a few days ago. And so advocacy from community members, calls and emails, that stuff, it, it really does, it does work. And then each council member usually has somewhere online where you can sign up to volunteer or sign up for updates. So that's another um, great way to get involved. But more than anything else, I think just people coming together to do something is important. So my, the first thing I usually send folks to do is to find a set of organizations or two that, that really speaks to you. I, I really appreciate that advice. I think it's great advice. And and I, I also appreciate the thing that you said about how, you know, the advocacy groups, they have the opportunity to sort of take those deep dives into policy um, that the individual doesn't necessarily have. I really appreciate that, you know, everybody doesn't have to become a subject matter expert on every topic just in, in order to get involved, you know. And so uh, thank you for that. I, I want to sort of touch on something I briefly talked about in that, you know, one of the memos we got today, we got our first report from the OPO, the Office of Police Oversight, sorry, no acronym, uh, on officer-involved shooting. The the Office of Police Oversight found that eight of the 12 times Austin officers used their firearms on a call in 2018, it involved a black or brown person. Um, other than that, you know, I obviously had some takeaways, but I'm just curious, you know, if you've had an opportunity to dig into it yet, and if so, what are some of your takeaways so far? Yeah, you know, it. I'm first of all, I was just so it's so important that we have an office of police oversight with way more authority um, than we have ever had in the past, uh, and that's because of the advocacy of Austinites saying we need an office of police oversight that's independent and has authority mm -hmm. to issue their own reports, reports to start their own investigation. So it's really you know, we're getting these reports now. Uh, with so much better information than we had before. Uh, all of the complaints on the use of police violence during the protests are now all online. Before you couldn't, even if you were a complainant, you couldn't even sometimes see the status of your complaint. So we're finally getting a level of transparency so that people uh, don't feel like they're getting gaslighted. I mean, this is the stuff that we've always known, which is, yeah, you've got way more folks of color um, that are being impacted by officer-involved shootings. Uh, of the people that were killed by officers, all of them, or black and brown folks, uh, overwhelmingly in Southeast Austin, um, but of course spread around the city. So, so, you know, it's just important that we have the information so we can, so people can't, you know, act like it's not a problem and that it's not real, it's right there. And then we have to actually act to change on it, make change. I think a couple of things that I pulled out of the report too, is that half of the calls that resulted in these officer involved shootings had a mental health component. And mm -hmm. You know, we, we, I think this year we have a huge opportunity to say, why are we sending a police officer to address mental health issues when there's mental health professionals? You can, there's only so much training you can do. You can never train a police officer to be something that they're not. They're, there's a police right. officer and that they've got a specific job. But, you know, uh, mental health issues, we can respond to those in a different way. And that could have a drastic shift. And then also, frankly, right, the over-policing of communities of color is oftentimes right. going to result in um, more officer-involved shootings in, in uh, of our community, apart from obvious other issues of bias and racism. But we just know right. that we uh, face over-policing too. So there's there's a lot there, but I think there's just putting the report out there and not hiding the facts, I think, is a really important piece of this too. Yeah, I, I definitely tend to agree with you. You know, I, I responded to a question about it earlier today. Um, and I think the original question was, are you surprised? It's like, no, I'm not surprised, but I'm, I'm really relieved and grateful that we have this tangible evidence, this tangible data. You know, nobody can, yeah, I think you said gaslight earlier, but nobody, nobody can deny the truth, you know, that has been gathered by, you know, uh, 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 independent bodies. And so I really, I really appreciate having the facts and the data. Um, so, you know, I don't have to tell you, but we also got a bombshell of a memo this afternoon from city manager Kronk about reimagining public safety in Austin, you know, and these are conversations obviously that we've been having nonstop for um, months and months, but you know, they, they've been, you know, 
really highlighted in the last few weeks. Have you really been able to dig into that memo and process any of it yet? You know, it, it lays out what community members have been asking us for for a really long time, which is to say that public safety cannot just rely entirely on policing, that we've got to start thinking of lots of other ways to keep people safe. Because part of why we see that the issues that we see, even as the city hires more and more and more police officers, there's a lot of folks that don't feel any more safe or see the benefits of that. And it's because, you know, maybe we could start thinking of treating homelessness with housing rather than just treating it with a night in jail and then folks are back out on the street no better off. Or treating addiction with treatment rather than with policing, which we know isn't going to solve the root issues of addiction. And so basically the manager, I think, is recognizing and listening to what the community and council voted on last week, really with your leadership, Councilmember Harper Madison, to say, you know, we should need to start funding and thinking of other forms of public safety. And maybe we should stop thinking of, you know, somebody selling loose cigarettes as something that requires a bunch of cops to show up and then sometimes results in a person um, being killed unjustly or somebody like Larry Jackson, um, you know, basically for showing up at a, at a bank with, um, with hot glue on his, on his fingers, wound up killed and dead unjustly. And so we have to start thinking about the fact that, you know, sending somebody with a gun to each and every one of these situations may not be the best thing, that there's a lot of situations where we, we can take a different approach and make things safer. Absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, I, I think that's a really good segue into asking you a difficult question, um, one that I, I I'm often pondering. Uh, do you think as policymakers, um, do you think we can honestly make policies that can reverse Austin's history of racism? You know, I, I think more about how it's our job. It's what we have to do. You know, it was people in our seats who made the decisions that bolstered racism. Um, and the question is, is it within our power and people in these same seats to undo that? And and I've seen a lot of really good things we've been able to do in the last few years, but none of them have clearly been enough. And so instead of, so I'm not sure, I think the answer to the question honestly is I don't know, but I think the community is calling on us to try. And there's people on our dais that are, you know, I think really all committed to trying like hell. Um, yeah. You know, when we went into the last police contract negotiations, there were all these news stories about you know, how many failures there had been and whether we could ever get to some level of reform. And I think we actually made some big change, but clearly not even close to enough. Um, right. we passed the Freedom City policies. We didn't know how many people we could keep out of jail and reduce disparities, but we actually reduced um, low level and discretionary arrests by 75% in our city. Tons of people not going, black and brown folks not going to jail for um, because of those votes. And so it took government decisions and business decisions to get us to where we are. And I don't think the government's going to be the, the folks that fix it, but we damn well could start at least undoing some of the bad stuff that has happened. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's our job. So we, we're, we're right. trying and I know how hard you're trying and, and we really need community buy-in um, um, for, for the culture to change too in our, in our, in our city. Um, around issues of race, because that's just haven't been, always been top of mind. Absolutely. Not top of mind at the city. Right. I uh, So I, I wonder if you're seeing uh, anything that other cities are doing that we could adapt here in Austin. Yeah, I actually was just um, dropped into the Seattle City Council meeting earlier today. Now that we're like Zoom meeting, it's easy to just go to other cities. Uh, there were council members from New York council members from Minneapolis, uh, council members from across the country talking about their strategies. And in, uh, in Eugene, Oregon, there's a group called Cahoots um, that actually responds uh, with you know, non-police officers to almost 100% of their mental health 911 calls. I mean, it's just incredible. We've started some of that here in Austin. Uh, in last year's budget, you, know, you and I worked together with council member Kitchen and others to start something more, more in that direction. But seeing places that have gone have made it managed to go that far, I think, is really, um, really important. And so I, I think there's models like that that we can look to 
um, in other cities. It, it's, it's doable. Absolutely. And I think it's incumbent on us to keep doing the research and to keep, you know, taking advantage of the technology we have advantage or uh, have access to right now to, to do that research and to just kind of figure out what best practices for people are, are uh, deploying in their cities. Um, to switch it up a little bit, um, COVID-19, our Latinx population still makes up most of the hospitalizations. Um, I'd like to know, in your mind's eye, how do we as a municipality improve outreach to this community? We are, we are have been uh, behind as a state and frankly, as a country on COVID-19. And so I feel like as a city, we're just trying to play catch up all the time on testing, on outreach, on all of these different things. Um, yeah. but we see that Latinos have been overwhelmingly amongst the most impacted along um, uh, with black community members suffering from COVID-19 at disproportionate rates. And so we are really having to focus in, I think, on, on our Spanish language communications, on our partnerships with, um, with community members that are deeply embedded in the Latino community. We know that the city, and we've been pushing the city to have more mobile testing sites because we know there's a lot of folks that, uh, that don't have a car and can't easily get through drive-through testing. Mm -hmm. But one of the, when we have gone to places, especially like construction sites that are overwhelmingly Latino, uh, we have heard from folks that get offered a free test that they don't want one because of immigration status concerns and two, because people are afraid that if they test positive, even if they're asymptomatic, that they won't be able to work and make the rent. And so uh, we've passed something to really tackle both of those issues, really communicate that there's not an immigration status impact. We won't be sending any information to law enforcement. And two, to start making sure that we have actually the funds to make sure that somebody doesn't have to lose their apartment or lose their car because they choose to stay home because we know that that really also impacts working class communities too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, unless there's any final thoughts you have for us, anything you want to leave us with, um, I'm about to bid you adieu. Is there anything you want to make yeah, sure to say before, before you, before before you get back? Off, you know, I, I, I just came on to this just uh, really happy to be able to join you on this because we've been in the trenches together so much since right. you started, but especially in these last few weeks. So I appreciate that leadership. And also some thoughts around, you know, there are lots of folks in District 1 and District 4 that that call 911, that rely on emergency services. And there's, you know, this question of, as we rethink public safety, what does that mean? And I think for a lot of folks in our community, they need other options. Other, you know, their policing has its place, but there has always been this lack of other options. Right. And, and as our communities have demanded more funding for education, more recreation, more youth services, more jobs, so often the city has said, no, not very much of any of these, but yeah, a lot more policing. Right. And, and we have to be able to provide that other stuff. And so I think that that's part of what, you know, some of our Eastern Crescent communities uh, have always been asking for, but haven't gotten it. I think in this moment, we finally can get some of the, more of that out there. So I, I just appreciate you having me on and look forward to working with you. Uh, you too. Thank you for joining us. And I, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Something tells me we'll be talking before the weekend. So uh, I won't okay. say too many times. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Right. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. All right. So now let's talk business. Uh, Governor Abbott is moving forward with his plans to reopen Texas, even as we're seeing a spike in cases. Hospitalizations in the Austin area are higher than they've been since this thing started. So, what are our local businesses doing to keep people safe while also keeping themselves solvent? Uh, today, we have several heads of our various chambers of commerce, uh, and they're here to talk about that right now. Uh, we have from the Greater Asian Chamber, Marina Bagara. I'm sorry. I'm going to say Marina, and she's going to tell me how to pronounce her last name. And then from the Bargava. say again, it's Bargava. Bargava, thank you. Um, and then from the Greater Hispanic Chamber, we have Thomas Miranda. Hi, everybody. Can you see in here? Okay. I can. Hello. Fantastic. Hey, in the age of of COVID, how often do you hear? Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Nonstop. Well, thank you both, both for joining us. We really appreciate it. 
Thank you for having us. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So I'll just kind of toss out a, a few questions as we go. Um, I'm I'm curious to know what y'all's what your experience is, what you're seeing, what your members are saying, what you're experiencing, both as patrons and you know folks who are are tasked as the stewards and people who are supposed to advocate for for businesses. So I really like to know, you know, what in your mind's eye, and anybody can grab it. What's the current state of our regional economy? You want to go first, Marina? Um, sure. So I think I'll talk about my members first. The economy is kind of larger and, and right. we're just kind of getting a sense of it. I know when, when the governor reopened the economy, I was talking to, to a lot of my members, particularly our restaurants who are, have been really hit hard, like, like all restaurants, right? right. Um, and most of them were not opening. So I think because a lot of us are immigrants and then we have family still in Asia and, you know, we saw what happened there and what those governments um, restrictions, what they did, and they're ahead, right? They, they kind of are in the future and we're like in the catch up space. So a lot of my members are actually very conservative and, and pretty afraid of opening. And so mm -hmm. they've taken a, a look, wait and see approach to, to that. Um, the members who are, you know, it's, I think it's pretty much the same, the, the professional services, they're, they're, opening, they've um, uh, invited their employees to come back to the office, but a lot of people haven't. Mm -hmm. And some of that is related to um, fears of being staying healthy, but also it's like, well, school and child care. So all those things are intersecting into their decision making about whether they, they can even go back to the office. Um, I think some of them have have reported back saying that they'll go into the office for half the day and then leave. So they're actually enjoying the flexibility that the, the current situation um, allows. And I can appreciate that. I think we have a little bit of a lag on your end. Can you hear us okay? okay. I can. Okay. Yeah, it's like, it's like a tiny bit of a delay. We'll get it figured out, don't worry. Um, so, you know, the, the second question I would ask, uh, Thomas, I'll ask you this. Um, what are you hearing from your members uh, in terms of their concerns and, and how are you working with them um, given uh, the governor's reopen orders? How are y'all working, you know, with your members to address their concerns given the, uh, given the, the need to coordinate uh, around reopening plans? So <clears throat> can you hear me okay? I can. <laughs> okay, awesome. So thank you again for having me on. Really appreciate it. It's Absolutely. good seeing you again. You too. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, we, we are definitely, we have a, in our membership, a, a cautiously optimistic group of, of folks that are really, you know, focusing on, on ensuring safety for the patrons and for staff, first and foremost. Uh, we don't really see or have many in our group, in our membership that I'm aware of that are kind of the maverick type, if you will, that is just mm -hmm. going out there and, and acting like everything's normal which is good in a way because that's representative of, you know, our, our culture and our values, I think. Um, but I would say that, you know, the, that cautious optimism is uh, they're really connected. Uh, a lot of our members are connected to our newsletters where we, we where we regularly twice a week put out a, a lot of information that we mm -hmm. gather on the data and on um, reopening um, procedures or uh, policies from the governor as well as the city. Um, and just in a lot of informing at this point, and we make ourselves open as well. If we can answer any questions, we get a lot of engagement on social media. We've activated that pretty heavily over the last six to eight months. And so we're, we're ripe for that uh, environment to really be active with our members. Um, but, you know, we, the cautious optimism is all I can say. We've seen in some restaurants, uh, some of, and, and we have several sectors, right? We, we represent members across all areas and, you know, I can't really speak for the at-large uh, Hispanic community, but really just the the sectors in our membership that uh, really really connect with us. Um, we our restaurants are actually seeing a slight uptick uh, in, in in some takeout and growth, and this was you know po a pre last week. So I know in the last few days things have changed somewhat uh, in terms of the uptick in in COVID, uh, but safety, safety, safety is really big for our our members. Um, 
uh, and informing our members as well uh, about the the um, uh, guidelines and and the data and you know some of the resources that we have both in English and in Spanish. Yeah. And you're probably going to be leading into this later, but uh, especially the uh, the question you asked uh, Greg Kassar around the Hispanic community. And so you know getting that data and knowledge out there as well as partnering with other organizations in the region who have those Spanish language resources is critical exactly. right now because we can't do it all. We're a, we're a small group, you know, in, in the, in the region uh, that cannot really access everybody in the Spanish uh, language uh, environment. So we're doing all that we can. I, I yeah, really whatever Thomas is doing on Spanish, like multiply that by five or six different languages and we're trying to do that wow. too. Wow. The nice thing about actually everything happening virtually is we've been able to plug into, you know, different organizations around the country who have, might be doing a PPP webinar in Korean or Vietnamese or Mandarin and just promote that to to the community. Um, yeah, we're, we're doing the same as Tomas, like just sending out information, making people are aware of the information and of the resources that are available so that they can access those. Um, we're actually doing a webinar tomorrow on reopening safely. And, you know, we try to have um, at least on the outreach um, information in those languages, just so people like know, like, okay, there's, there's something happening. And then they can ask the question. And then if they need more, then we can find somebody who can actually do the interpretation. That's great. Thank you. That actually was going to be, you know, some of my next lines of questions. Like, how are we communicating? And Marina, for you specifically, I, uh, I'd like to know, you know, I, I find that there are folks who really thrive in creating chaos. And there are some, some public officials that stoked some pretty unfortunate anti-Asian racism um, earlier this year. I'm just really curious about what it is that you all are doing, how, how are you communicating with your membership and, and I mean, what, what it is that you all are doing and how can we be more supportive in your efforts? Thank you so much for asking that question, Carl's member. So we saw um, things that are happening, luckily not so much locally here in Central Texas. Um, the things, the, the incidents that have been happening here have been not, not violent but they are occurring. So there was a temple on North Lamar that was vandalized. Um, somebody I know just was treated differently at a, an HEB when she was checking out. Just, and this literally just happened a couple of days ago. Wow. So it is happening here. So, you know, in the beginning when we were starting to hear about um, people telling, you know, noises happening, with some investigation, again, it, it turns out that there was actually um, concerns that were being brought up by the community. Um, so, be, uh, you know, because, again, they were in their minds ahead on, on where the pandemic was. So right. when uh, community events were happening, they were questioning, like, is it really safe to have it? So um, incidents that we originally thought were, were racist based were actually concerns from the community itself. So I just want to put that out there, that that was occurring. Um, we've created a website, um, a web page on our website. We've just been trying to raise awareness that, that things can be can happen. I mean, there, were, there was a family that was attacked in Midland, Texas. Um, so we just wanted to let the community know that just to be aware. And we wanted the larger community to know also that, you know, we were looking for allies, frankly. Um, we shared bystander trainings. Um, we actually had um, somebody from OPO come in and, and talk about how you as a business, if you see something happening, how do you, how, what can you do? Or if somebody's, you know, your business can actually um, create a safe place for somebody who's being attacked. So we've been sharing a lot of that information. Um, and yeah, that that's, we originally we were collecting um, reports on incidents, um, but that's another organization, another nonprofit is doing that now. We didn't collect too many locally, so that's that's good news. Well, that is good news, and you know, and why not why not take off on a good note? <laughs> I really appreciate you guys both being here this evening. Is there any um, anything you'd like to leave us with? Something you want to make sure that folks know um, before you before you get on with with the rest of your week? 
All right then. Well, thank oh, you. Oh, jump on what what, uh, what Council Member Kassar said about oh, getting please. involved. I think the chambers are great places to get involved, um, just to you know be engaged, you know, volunteer, um, and have your voice heard. So, absolutely, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, and I would just say I would just add, you know, I would echo what Marina said too about getting involved and. Uh, from what we're going to be doing at the Hispanic Chamber, as well as I'm sure the other chambers too, uh, we're going to be undertaking a lot more digital engagement and involvement and, and outreach and electronic uh, outreach, kind of like you know what you're doing here. So we're we're working on a, a number of plans and, and including events and and activities uh, because we just don't know uh, what the future is going to look like. So we want to be prepared. In the in the in the real world, the physical world, and the virtual world, so the hybrid model is coming. So be on the lookout. I'm looking forward to the adaptable hybrid. I think we all should be. Okay. Uh, well, again, thank you both for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and stay safe. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. You too. Bye. Take Absolutely. care. Bye. All right, folks. So moving right along. Uh, one sector of our economy in particular is in tough shape right now. Um, and live music is, is one of those things that by its definition isn't entirely comp compatible with social distancing. Um, we're gonna talk to Cody tonight from the Red River Cultural District. And we're gonna you know, just talk about, about some of those concerns. I don't see Cody yet. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Hi, Cody. How's it going? I think you might be muted. We can't hear you. Classic move. Sorry about that. It's real good to see you. It's good to see you also. I hope you're doing well. I see you got the, the blinds drawn. That heat is woo. <laughs> <laughs> it's that time well, you'll, you'll probably like see me dart over at some point to close the curtains because I can see the sun starting to encroach upon me. So let me know if it gets to be a distraction and I'll jump over there uh, sooner than later. Uh, well, so again, thank you for joining us tonight. We're just talking about business in general. We had some members of the chamber who joined us to, you know, just kind of talk about some of the things that their members are going through. What are their concerns? And, you know, we ended on a really good note talking about adaptability, talking about, you know, what does the evolution look like for some of these folks? And so to talk about the concerns faced in this industry, um, you know, we would be remiss not to say that, you know, the music industry is so important. And, you know, it, it's a part of Austin's DNA, um, as are you, Cody Cohen, um, <laughs> the executive director of the Red River Cultural District. Um, I, for anyone not familiar, I want you to tell us, tell them um, what the Red River Cultural District is. Yeah, so the Red River Cultural District is an area downtown between 6th and 12th Street. That's where all the concentration of live music venues are. You'll find Stubbs, Cheer Up Charlie's, Mohawk, Elysium, so many more. There's, it's the largest concentration of live music venues in Austin. Um, and it's really the heart of the music experience, the music economy, and has a lot of food, a lot of hotels and lodgings. It's, it's the cultural tourism corridor of the city. So uh, here we've, uh, venues have been down on the district for well over a hundred years and we carry it. We're just trying to carry on that long tradition um, in really hard times right now. Sorry about that. I can hear you, but I, but you can't see me. I was, I was doing that thing where I said, cause I could see the sun just coming to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming to join the show. Well, so I, I really appreciate that. And, and I, I, uh, we saw several high profile closures last week, including Barracuda on E7. Um, just to, I think just to be realistic, to be honest, to really kind of start thinking through what the future is going to look like. Should we be bracing for more closures? Yeah, to echo some of the things I've shared with you and others on council over the past three months, um, we're, we, as well as our uh, sister organization, NEVA, the National Independent Venue Alliance, which, which is a conglomerate of over 2,000 venues nationally, we're tracking a 90% loss of all live music venues in America. Uh, that is without there being some sort of basic rent or, or other disaster relief assistance. I mean, wow. uh, if you think about it, these are spaces that, that have large footprints. The square footage is about having P 
people in there having a great time, going crazy and, and enjoying themselves. I mean, these venues, as well as many other service industry jobs were the first to close and are gonna be the last to reopen. I mean, if the business model is say Mohawk is built around selling a thousand tickets um, to pay rent, uh, I don't see that happening this year or probably mm -hmm. before vaccine is created. All the tours and festivals, which also feed all these venues, um, you know, venues probably get 80% plus of their revenue, the type of venues we have in the district from tours and festivals. And again, those aren't happening until 2021 sometime. Um, so we've just had 98% of the people I know have been out of work for three months and it's it's just really hard. There's, there's no path forward to safely reopen or reopen at all. It's simply because the business model doesn't allow for that. You know, it's, it's about crowds and it's about people feeling relaxed, comfortable, and really enjoying these, these safe spaces. I mean, think about it. Venues are some of the last safe spaces in our country where you can go and you can be who you are and, and celebrate that and, and, having to worry about life and limb and uh, is, is not really conducive for that environment, particularly when the numbers and math doesn't add up. Right. So, you know, I've, I've been sharing with y'all, we really need, we really need that rental assistance. Folks don't own their own land. Um, I know we have th that clear package that y'all approved as well as the creative spaces assistance. It would be really great if we could get city manager to move that out. I mean, at, at this point, I don't understand why more venues haven't closed, quite frankly. I, I, I would be sadly happy if we retain 30% of the venues in Austin. I don't see a path forward to doing that right now. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to do everything I can to help find that money to retain like amazing cultural spaces like Cheer Up Charlie's and to also help staff eat through like our bit disaster relief work with banding together um, you know, whether you're a venue operator or someone who's tending bar, most people don't have more than a month or two of savings in their pocket. It's, so, yeah. it's, you know, we're, we're three months into this and we don't really see for our industry this changing um, for a year or more. Um, so that, that tells you how dire things are on the ground. It's, it's really hard. Yeah. And you honestly... All on your own. You answered half of my questions. It's like, it's like you saw my list. But I mean, those are relatively obvious questions, right? I think maybe one that you didn't necessarily answer. And I, I know a lot of folks are wondering, how can individuals help sustain businesses and the many musicians and service industry people that they support? I know that I've been making a point to, even when I can't stick around for the whole show, I've been making a point to go to virtual concerts and make sure to to add some, some cash in those virtual tip jars. And I just wonder if you have any ideas and, you know, again, speaking about that adaptation, adaptability, rather, do you have any ideas for how individuals can, can help out here? I know there's a lot of folks feeling really helpless right now. Yeah, I know. It's like, how, how can you help? We live in really, we really live in rough times where we're called, to action both by our hearts as well as to the urgency of the moment, whether we're looking at uh, COVID and the economy or whether we're looking at the larger and broader social justice issue around Black Lives and Black Lives Matter. I mean, everyone needs to figure out how that, how they can make that impact. I think for, if you want to help directly for folks who are working in industry, then uh, again, donating to Banding Together is a great way. We're giving out $75 gift cards from HEB to every recipient. We've given out $40,000 so far and um, we'll be giving out another $70,000 starting this Friday. So that's a great way just to help people who have that food insecurity, that insecurity yeah. of like uh, getting their medicine and other uh, needs at the store, uh, of course, any musicians that are live streaming or the, some of these concerts that are happening, those are great ways of supporting music and musicians, as well as the merch uh, movements for the live music venues. I mean, every little bit helps. I mean, again, we got a handful of great donors at Banding Together, like Stand With Austin and several private donors, but it's mostly hundreds of people like us giving five, 10, $20. I mean, it's, it's like, it's heartbreaking. It's inspiring for me because <clears throat> I see the list of these people I know a good deal of them and I see who's donating and it's the same people that I know are going to have to be applying for this sort of help later. So, yeah. you know, 
everything helps. I think this is this is the moment, though, whether it's around economy or again some of the the ongoing larger civil rights issues that we get to prove who we are by what we do now. Right? This is the right. moment. This is the Absolutely. defining moment. So it's really exciting in that sense. This is where the adaptation, I think, is key. It's it's no longer sitting back and being passive. We we get to show who we are. And uh, for now, with venues, unfortunately, that means doing little things. And of course, supporting you and, and Greg and others on council who are trying desperately to get that money to keep these spaces open. And of course, other efforts like what do equitable safe spaces look like in the future? Because without a partnership between council and between private organizations like mine and others, we're not going to be able to create those in the future to replace everything that we've unfortunately we're going to lose. So, yeah. uh, but for the, 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 the average person on ground, it's just like, take care of yourself, take care of the people around you. This, this is, this is what we do in times like this. This is what I know probably our grandparents or great grandparents did during the great depression and in every other hard time we've had since then. So uh, it's it's inspiring. A lot of us have been trained and prepared for this our whole lives. This is like for those of for those of us working class folk, it's like a Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> but it, I think it's going. Unfortunately, it's going to get harder before it gets better. Um, even if we don't know what the economy is going to look like or the, the the country by 2021. So that tells me, hey, it's not time to to get down on ourselves. We can all grieve naturally in our own environments, but this is time to come together. This right. is time for unity. This is time to get to work and take care of one another. I couldn't agree more. And and honestly, I don't know that I, I could possibly end it any better. <laughs> that was perfect. I mean, you, you literally answered every possible question I could have had. I, I couldn't appreciate you being here more. I look forward to us, you know working more in the future and collaborating more in the future. I, I know that it, it does feel hard, but I, I I agree with your sentiment. It feels so beautiful and so inspiring, you know, watching people, you know, figure out how to evolve and adapt and transform. And and frankly, you know, one of the most inspirational parts is the selflessness, people really just showing up for one another. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think, you know, it, it's one of those times where there's some, where there's some light in the tragedy. And so, Thank you so much for, for your candor and for being with us tonight. I really appreciated having you on. And I look forward to, to working with you more in the future. Thank you so much, Natasha. Thank you, Thank you for your service and keep keep doing fighting the good fight. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It was a pleasure to have you. Pleasure. All right, y'all. So I can't believe it, but we have made it to our final segment of the night. And despite my best efforts, the sunshine is chasing me. So... <laughs> Uh, eventually you're going to see me like mute my camera just for a second. So I'm going to close the last of the blinds. Um, so in, in more normal times, traffic and mobility rank really high among the top concerns we have here in Austin. Obviously these aren't normal times, uh, but the current challenges we face do intersect with those concerns. So I am all too proud to have on a brilliant rising star in Austin, like me, Yasmin Smith, Esquire, is a native Austinite. She's got a bachelor's in criminal justice at St. Ed's and her law degree from UT. She's the managing partner of Smith & Mendoza PLLC and director of development at the Austin Area Urban League. Um, because she doesn't have enough going on. She's also my appointee. <laughs> she's also my appointee for the Board of Adjustments and she serves as vice chair of People United for Mobility Action. Her interest in mobility action is precisely why we have her on tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us, Yasmin. Good to be here. How are you doing? I'm okay. I told you that sun is chasing me. Can you see it? Look, girl, look, look. You see, if I just move to the side, it's right here. It never goes away. Not in Texas. Not You're great, right? You're great where you are. I just don't have a, it's like I can't find a spot. So I'm just going to go close the last of those blinds real quick. But I'll ask you a couple quick questions and I can hear you, but you'll be talking to the audience as I mute my camera for just a second. Um, okay. Thanks for coming on. You know, I, I talk a lot about mobility and you know i had the opportunity to to see what other cities and some folks in other countries are doing around mobility and transit and uh, and how transit and social justice inherently collide you know so you're the vice president of puma um for those who aren't familiar can you tell us what that is and how it came to be 
For sure. So PUMA stands for People United for Mobility Action. And we are a group of completely different backgrounds, expertise, um, and perspectives and life understanding. Um, and we have come together and are dedicated to transforming Austin um, so that every single person has access to safe, affordable, and convenient choices to get around uh, and meet their, their daily needs. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I sorry, like I said, I can, ah, there we go. <laughs> I ran from it. <laughs> well, and so, you know, just moving right into it, you know, racial and social justice uh, obviously are having their day in the spotlight lately. And spotlight meaning it, it's not new, it's just in the spotlight. Uh, I think transit and mobility definitely have a part in those conversations. I'd really love to hear your thoughts on the matter. For sure. So, none of these systems work in silos. And if we truly want to transform how our society runs and operates, we must take particular consideration into literally how it's constructed and how we get around. Um, and the conversations between specifically uh, the criminal justice sphere um, and the evolution that needs to take place in policing um, have a direct correlation to transportation and transportation issues. Um, the most direct being specifically because black and brown uh, bodies are overly policed and do not feel safe um, in a single occupier vehicle, um, it almost seems almost negligent to me if a city does not offer alternatives where each person um, can feel comfortable getting from point A to point B. Um, it's really something that we care deeply about at yeah. Puma. Um, this concept of mobility justice, where uh, we take as a society every single person's vulnerability into consideration uh, when we construct that which will transport them. Absolutely. And, and those are things that I think, you know, if you really dig down deep and think about it, of course, naturally that makes sense. But I, I think so often we sort of take things for granted and just don't think about it on that granular level and just how everything is connected. So last week, cancel, council moved the Project Connect plan forward. Uh, it's looking very likely that we'll be asking voters to approve a multi-billion investment in the program in November. Um, do you have thoughts about the plan so far? So um, I am always excited uh, for an evolution uh, when it comes to uh, transit and public transit specifically. Um, I look forward uh, to the continuation of uh, vulnerable population voices in that process. Now, I do believe that council took a great step in the resolution in April um, that specified uh, that there must be, uh, you know, allocations of funds specifically in regards to making sure um, that the negative impacts that Project Connect could provide um, are mitigated. Um, I do wish it had happened earlier, um, but I'm glad for that first step. I would also uh, go further as to say that the articulation by both Council and Capital Metro of the importance of Black and Brown bodies uh, in this process, um, having moved along last week when those same bodies were and still are and have been in survival mode, um, one could argue that that is counterintuitive. Uh, to uh, the articulated goal. Um, so in short, I'm sorry, a lot of jargon at the end of the day. In short, I like uh, the future that Project Connect could provide. Yeah. However, uh, due to um, historical precedent, um, I am weary, but optimistic. I appreciate the optimism. I appreciate your candor about being weary. You know, these are the kinds of conversations that we have to have candidly. So like you said, everybody's got to be a part of the conversation, a part of the dialogue. We have to make it so, uh, so that, you know, considerations around mobility justice are all of our charge. It can't just be, you know, for one group or another. Um, so I'm just curious. So if, if voters approve the investment in November. Uh, we'll be looking at years and years of construction that will dra dramatically transform our city. So council's already started uh, the ball rolling on working to head off 
displacement related uh, to these investment mm -hmm. displacement related to these investments. And I think that's what you were getting at earlier when you were saying, you know, the the manifestation of this, like what will be that what will be negative outcomes, potential negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I, I'm what do you want to see in order to feel more confident that Project Connect won't just make our current problems worse as we're talking about those specific things? You know, is there anything in particular that you would like to see um, that won't exacerbate current problems? So first of all, definitely the interjection of vulnerable voices in every sphere and every step of the process. Um, and then a commitment in writing um, that those voices will be listened to. Um, I feel as though uh, we have an unfortunate uh, trend of uh, using vulnerable voices as rubber stamps um, rather than actually paying heed to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, more than anything, yes, I want uh, everyone to be in the room, everyone's voice to be listened to, a commitment uh, by uh, the council and uh, Capital Metro to uh, actually implement those voices into the plan itself. And then quite honestly, I wanna see the good outcome. I wanna see it when the rubber meets the road, I want to see um, the visioning and the collective goals uh, actually manifest in an equitable way. You said when the rubber meets the road, was that intentional? It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so you also participated in some conversations that have been uh, happening over the course of the year around uh, the proposal to rebuild I-35. I'm very curious to know what your thoughts are on those plans right now. And is there any reason to be excited, worried? You know, what? where are you at on, on that whole uh conversation and process? Again, I am both weary and optimistic, right? So um, there, has been, <laughs> there has been more conversation than historically of interjecting voices, especially from vulnerable com uh, communities right. in the processes and procedures. Do you think it came a little later than I'd want it to, right? Just mm -hmm. like the resolution, it, we are taking the right steps, um, but we must take those steps in the very creation of the idea, not once it's already passed creation and we're just being, you know, uh, not spoon fed, I'd say, but we have definitely a particular lens on the options before us once it gets to vulnerable populations. Um, but I'm excited that of the possibility that mm -hmm. the like reconstruction of I-35 has, if you guys don't know about this, sorry, I'm gonna nerd out. So you're talking about sinking I-35, right? And then they're going to they'll at least build the mechanisms by which we could build on top of I-35. Now, some people don't seem excited about this, but this is like literally plats of land coming out of like thin air, literally. And so it opens up the possibility for our you know, housing crisis. It opens up the possibility for green space. It opens up the possibility to really reimagine what I-35 um, has been to this community. Um, and so that, so though I am weary, um, I am really, really optimistic, especially um, if uh, the community's voices are actually listened to, which is right. all a tricky, tricky wicket. Um, but I, I am very, very excited. I would like to put onus on the NEPA process that's happening. It's basically a process, a federally, federally mandated process by which um, there has to be uh, like a, a, a report on and, uh, consequences to the surrounding area um, that this highway is going to impact. Um, yeah. So I am really excited for um, the interjection of ideas um, and perspectives um, in the NEPA process and the very design um, of the future of I-35. I appreciate that. And I gotta tell you, your enthusiasm. Um, especially because I think a lot of folks, honestly, especially folks unlike you and I, um, don't know Austin history and know what I-35 low key means. Like why- it's High key, it's high key. Right. <laughs> so, you know, what, what, what the symbolism is of this highway and 
thinking through the possibility of true east-west connections. You know, there's so much, we're on the precipice of so much in the way of literally breaking down walls and highways right now and recognizing, you know, that there are, that there's a, there's a lot, of, it's not just a highway we bury, we're going to bury and, you know, deeply entrench some things that came along with it. And I, exactly. that's one of the things that I'm truly excited about. And so, yeah, I'm just as excited as you are there. Um, I, I, we have a couple minutes left and I'd love for you to be able to talk about anything that you're working on that you want to share with the folks or anything that you want to make sure to say before our time is up tonight. Um, and I try to make this statement whenever I am in clear mind and good spirit. Um, but I would say, if I had anything to say, is that we as a society, um, especially with the systems that organize our society, whether that is policing um, or mobility or transportation infrastructure, we must begin at the very creation, interjecting voices of all, especially those from vulnerable communities. It is only when we interject those voices in every step of the process of yeah. the policy from creation to uh, planning, to design, to budgeting, to creation and manifestation, to upkeep, it, they, we must be in all pieces. We must be at all tables in this structure in order to see an equitable future. And if that structure, if that table is ill-equipped to handle that due diligence, then it is up to us to create a space and reimagine a structure that is better equipped. This is not just laying down concrete anymore. Right. We cannot see it that way. This is laying down the veins of our society and how we will interact with one another and what benefits we will have. And any hope for equity in all spaces must take into consideration the very bricks upon which the society sits. Well, that's a good point. You were in good spirit tonight because I'm going to take that with me for the remainder of the week. Thank you for sharing and thank you for joining us. It has been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate that you said on multiple occasions because I, I sometimes feel like this too, but I, I wonder if, you know, if if we get gaslighted so much that we start to wonder if it's us when we're weary and enthusiastic simultaneously. And so I, I really appreciate your candor around the projects that we discussed and, and thank you for your service. Uh, we couldn't be more grateful. I don't know that a lot of folks recognize the level of effort and time and service that goes into the volunteer position that is serving as a commissioner. So thank you very much. I couldn't be more proud. Um, and you can look forward to some many more calls from me. <laughs> I mean, you call away. You got the law. You call anytime, anytime. Thank and I really so do much. appreciate, I appreciate the work that you do. Um, and I'm you. just so excited to be able to be in the mix and help out when I can. Thank you very much, Yasmin. I appreciate having you on tonight. Hope you have a good rest of your week. Y'all too. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, folks. So we're about to come to a close. I can't believe it. So thanks to all my guests tonight. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, you don't need to hear me say it, but these are truly unprecedented times. So, so many of us are struggling with stress and trauma that gets triggered literally on a daily basis. I want to make sure that you take some time for yourself. And for anyone you know who's having a hard time, we are absolutely all in this together. I think most of our guests this evening touched on it. Uh, we're all in this together, y'all, and we need to stay in it together. And if you have any questions, you want to reach out to my office, you can always email me at district1, that's D-I-S-T-R-I-C-T, -I -I -T, the number one, at austintexas.gov. Again, I'm Natasha Harper-Madison. I hope very much that you will join us again next week for another live edition of Talk with Tasha. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and wherever you're able, try to have some fun. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>